one of the most impressive pieces of Quake's engine is undoubtedly its software renderer. Being fully 3D, many of the simplifying tricks that predecessor Doom employed simply did not apply in a fully immersive world. Instead, Quake's creators produced an ingenious system that wrung every last bit of power out of the first generation Pentium processor. In this video, we'll explore the hierarchy of optimizations that Quake uses, from culling down level geometry to placing individual pixels on the screen. In essence, Quake's software renderer is a sequence of prunings, each stage removing work for the next. The first such stage operates on the BSP tree. If you've seen my video on collision detection, you'll recall that the BSP tree divides the level up by repeatedly splitting into two. The BSP tree that is used for rendering contains polygons. These are primarily stored on non-leaf nodes, with each polygon appearing on exactly one node. Each empty leaf also references a list of faces that appear on the leaf's boundary. A given polygon may be referenced from two or more leaves, if it happens to lie on the boundary of more than one leaf. At the start of each frame, the game walks this tree, setting a flag on polygons for rendering. The hierarchical nature of the BSP tree means huge areas of the level can be skipped in a single step. For example, custom culling ignores areas of the tree that are outside of the player's field of view. Custom culling works by walking through the tree and at each node comparing a bounding box for the node with a volume called the view frustum. The bounding box bounds all the polygons in the current node's subtree, and the view frustum represents the regional space that lies within the player's screen area. If there is no intersection, then nothing in this subtree can be visible, and so the node is skipped. Otherwise, the search proceeds into the node's children. When a leaf is encountered, it can be marked for rendering. A second mode of culling involves the pre-calculated Potentially Visible Set, or PVS. I've previously made a video on how this is constructed, but for now it suffices to know that it stores a list of potentially visible leaves for every leaf in the tree. This means that if the player is in a given leaf, and the PVS does not indicate that a second leaf is visible, then this leaf can be safely ignored. Ahead of the tree walk, the game works out which leaf the player is in, and flags each leaf in the player's PVS as potentially visible, along with all the ancestor nodes of these leaves. The tree walk can then skip any nodes that have not been flagged, since they are known to not contain any visible leaves. The final tree walk looks like this, with only a small fraction of the level being marked for rendering. A further culling of faces occurs that is a subtle consequence of the way in which the tree is walked and the order in which faces are marked. I mentioned earlier that faces are stored on internal or non-leaf nodes. Each polygon that is stored on a node actually lies within the node splitting plane. The tree is walked in front to back order, meaning that whenever an internal node is encountered, the side that the player is on is walked first. Before moving on to the far side, any marked faces are pushed into the next stage of rendering. Back faces may be marked by a leaf on the far side, but they will not be rendered, since the faces for the node have already been processed. Not rendering back faces is valid, since the level geometry guarantees that these faces will always be obscured. The game has done a decent job of culling as many polygons as it can. At this point, we could render the polygons directly, since the game is drawing from front to back, we just need to make sure that we don't draw over anything we have already drawn, and we should end up with a properly rendered scene. It turns out that this method, even with all the culling we've done, is still too slow in some cases. For complex scenes, there can be multiple polygons at many points in the image, so even just testing whether we've already drawn a pixel ends up being costly. Instead, Quake takes a different approach, which completely eliminates overdraw. The approach taken involves stepping through the scan lines of the screen one at a time. Quake produces a set of non-overlapping spans for each scan line, with one span for each polygon that appears in it. The span data structure contains the start row and column, and the width of the span in pixels. Each span is stored in a list referenced from the relevant polygon. Once all the spans have been produced, the screen is drawn, polygon by polygon, span by span, and pixel by pixel, with zero overdraw. This sounds great, but we still need a way to produce the spans, and it needs to be fast. This is the method that the Quake developers came up with. 
To begin with, edges are produced for all the polygons that are left after the initial culling, which are then clipped to the view frustum and projected into screen space. Quake keeps two lists of edges for each scanline. One contains the new edges, edges whose top falls on the scanline. The other contains edges to be removed, edges whose bottom falls on the scanline. Horizontal edges are removed. Each edge's initial horizontal position, as well as its slope, is stored. This setup means that the horizontal positions of the edges on any particular scanline can be determined by scanning from top to bottom, adding new edges using the new edge lists, updating edges with the slope information, and removing edges using the remove edge lists. The list of edges for a particular line is known as an active edge list, or AEL. For a given scanline, each edge in the AEL is a potential start or end of a span. If the edge is the left edge of a polygon that is in front of all other polygons at this pixel, then a new span needs to be started. On the other hand, if an edge is the right edge of a span that is currently the frontmost, then the current span needs to be ended. To make this process easier, Quake stores a reference to the polygon that appears to the left and to the right of each edge. As the AEL is updated, it is kept sorted in left to right order. For each scanline, the game steps through the active edge list, keeping an active polygon list, or APL. Each time an edge is encountered, the polygon to the left is removed from the APL, and the polygon to the right is added to the APL. The active polygon list itself is sorted by the distance from the camera, using the order in which the surface was encountered in the tree walk as a key. Whenever the top polygon on the list changes, the span for the old top is ended, and a span for the new top is created. Once the spans have been calculated, the polygons are traversed one at a time, and the spans for these polygons are rasterized. This method might seem overcomplicated, and perhaps even inefficient in terms of the computation required to manage the active edge and polygon lists. Bear in mind though that the AEL and APLs are almost always very short thanks to the prior culling stage, making the sorting operations very fast. It is hard to reverse engineer the design choices made during Quake's development since, as is often the case with optimizing code, you simply need to try out the alternatives. Thankfully much of this process has been described in Michael Abrash's Graphics Programming Black Book. Abrash worked closely with lead programmer John Carmack on the rendering technology for Quake, all the while documenting the process in this epic work, available online. The tome covers, amongst hundreds of other things, the development process behind many aspects of the Quake engine. I highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in the nuts and bolts of historical game development, 